Heavenly Father, may your word live in us and bear much fruit to your glory. Amen. So this morning, we are with Jesus in the temple. The context is important to understanding what this is all about. So let us examine it for a moment. This incident, with the others close by in the end of Luke's Gospel, all occur after the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Jesus has ridden in on the donkey, crowds have yelled out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Then Jesus went into the temple, he turned over the tables of the money lenders. So during the week that follows, Jesus goes to the temple every day and teaches. What he teaches, what Jesus says is provocative and the strong sects don't know quite how to handle it. First of all, we have a record of the chief priests, the scribes and the elders, who are all the really important people of the temple, and they come and ask Jesus, by whose authority he is doing these things? Jesus asks a question in return about the authority of John the Baptist. And when they choose politically not to answer, then he refuses to answer their question. In response, he tells a very provocative parable about a vineyard which is always traditionally the symbol for Israel itself. Which is, and this vineyard has been in the hands of tenants who ultimately kill the owner's son. Now, for us with hindsight, there's not much doubt what Jesus was on about, is there? So next they ask him a question to try to trap him about the relationship between God and the state. You remember the question. It's about paying taxes to the emperor. And Jesus replies, you remember, he shows them a coin. He says, give to the emperor the things we used to say, render unto Caesar, didn't we? He says, give the emperor the things that are the emperor's and give to God the things that are God's. You can imagine the frustration of the temple leaders building, can't you? So next, the Sadducees have a go. The Sadducees are a very interesting sect. They're tied very closely with the temple worship. They were from wealthy, important families and they considered themselves the elite because of their connection with the temple. And many of them are actually priests in the temple. The thing that distinguished the, the, the Sadducees from the Pharisees, at least as far as we have been able to, to work out, was that they refused to accept anything in the Hebrew Bible apart from the first five books, the so-called Pentateuch, five books, or Torah, the law. Now, we also know, because Luke tells us it right here, that the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. We have no idea what the Sadducees thought happened after, after death. Um, and the Sadducees as a group were completely destroyed at the fall of the temple in 70 AD. So we have no way, really, of filling in any of the gaps. Most of the texts in the Hebrew Bible that deal with resurrection are in other parts, not in the Torah. They're in Job, they're in Psalms, and in other prophetic texts, but not in the Pentateuch, not in those first five books. So Jesus uses a text from the Pentateuch to beat them at their own game. The question that they're asking is not in any way genuine. They're not interested in the laws governing Leverite marriage or anything like that. They just want to trap Jesus. This is hard for us because we believe in the resurrection already. And, and, you know, the question often worries us. It's the kind of thing that concerns people who have been married multiple times, and so many of us, you know, that's true, isn't it? Um, the question might come up when a person wonders about who they should be buried next to. They're 
um, adored first husband who died young or their much-loved second husband who shared the end of their life with them? You know, that's a question that concerns people. People are worried about who will greet them when they get to heaven. And in that sense, this question is a complete red herring. The agenda of those who asked, who didn't believe there would be a resurrection, is to trap Jesus into saying the wrong thing. Jesus, of course, answers them skillfully and manages, despite the poor question, and you know, it's a bit of a ask a silly question, you get a silly answer kind of thing, in, it, but Jesus manages to not give them a silly answer. He says a couple of very important things. Using Moses, he first of all proves that there's a resurrection. And secondly, he explains that marriage, which is a purely human system, has no relevance to the resurrection. In the resurrection, he says, we will be like angels. And please note, he doesn't say we will be angels. It's one of the things that um, very often, particularly if a child has died, people say, oh, he's gone up to be an angel with Jesus. Well, no. We will be like the angels. What that actually means, I have no idea. But what I do know is that the important relationship that will endure is the one with God, our Father, whose precious children we will continue to be. Jesus isn't, I don't think, saying that human relationships are unimportant, but that human relationships are things that pertain to our earthly existence, not to our, our eternal life, whatever that might look like. I think that the things that we humans value so much, love between husband and wife, between parent and child, all those good things will be absorbed into the relationship and the love that we have for and with God. I think also that the systems that are necessary for regulating human life will no longer have to apply in eternity. The fundamental relationship, that of creator and created, that of lover and beloved, will fill all the space. So what does this mean for us right now? Well, I think it's a very interesting passage in the light of the current debate in our society about the nature of marriage and whether or not gay people should be given the right to legal marriage. What this passage says to me is that the giving in marriage, with all its legal implications around property, which of course is what our legal system is chiefly regulating, is completely unimportant in God's economy. Jesus, in his other comment about marriage, which is when he's being asked about divorce, seems to me to be concerned for the interests of the weaker parties. He says that God has given us marriage and that the only ground for breaking that relationship is unchastity. Now, it is quite clearly the behaviour of the wife to which he refers, and he is seeking to protect her. Men in the ancient world, as in the modern world, let's be honest, uh, frequently married women to attain power or money or status. These having been acquired, they were in the habit of quietly divorcing their wives and frequently, of course, marrying a new one. They traded her in. The only thing that's really changed is that now women are equally capable of such behaviour. Since the law changed, and, and first of all, we women were allowed to have rights in our own property, and then finally rights in the joint income of the partnership. Jesus, I think, is not concerned to protect the status quo, but rather to improve the conditions of the underdogs. I have to say that in the current debate about same-sex marriage, marriage, personally, I think that Jesus would be on the side of gay couples who want the same rights as others. We tend to think in our society that marriage is all about sex. But indeed, it is 
and it always has been far more about property. The only reason that chastity was important for a woman was to ensure that any progeny who inherited were the children of the right father. Jesus seems to me to be saying that it is the quality of relationship that's the important thing in marriage, not to whom we are married. The second really important thing that we need to take away from this passage is that the resurrection is real. The resurrection is part of God's plan. We have many different ideas in our society about life after death, and I talked about this the other night at the um, All Souls service, so I'm not going to repeat myself. That sermon will be up on the web, so you can listen to it if you want to. But let me say that the one thing we have no real way of knowing, we don't know about how eternal life works, we don't know about why the resurrection works, the only certainty that we can have about resurrection is that of who. In Jesus comes the resurrection of the dead for us. It is with God that we will continue to be in relationship. God will be our father, Jesus says, when we are the children of resurrection. The Trinity itself exists in a relationship, in the great perichoretic dance that keeps the creation in existence. And we do and will join in that relationship. We're part of the resurrection now, you know, even though we're still alive in our earthly bodies. Now, even though we have no way of knowing what this means in a material sense, or even if it means anything in a material sense, we can be sure, however, of our relationship with the great creator God through the incarnation, the death and resurrection of Jesus and the continuing life-giving action of the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, the resurrection at work in us now. So how do we apply that to our lives here and now? Well, it strikes me that in all of this, the really important thing is not in trying to prove Jesus wrong, or for that matter, trying to prove Jesus right about resurrection or even about marriage. The important thing is to live in relationship with him and with others in the body of Christ. Our human relationships of marriage and parenthood, siblings and other family members and friends are not so important eternally but the relationship that we have in the eternal body of Christ with God and with each other, that, that is important. Of course, I think the earthly relationships are kind of subsumed in the eternal ones anyway. So my prayer for us as part of the body of Christ that meets here together is that we might deepen our relationship with God our Father and with each other. I pray that we might treat each other with the care that we would have God show us. I pray that those around us might see that we are Christians by our love and be drawn into deeper relationship with God right now rather than waiting until after they die. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.